Good morning, New Jerusalem. Amen. What a great day to praise the Lord. Amen. And good morning to those that have joined us online this morning. All the Christians and friends that we have that have joined us, we thank you. We ask that you open your hearts this morning and your mind. Let the Lord speak to you as we go to him in prayer. Oh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, for he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. Our righteous and eternal God, Father, as we present ourselves this morning before you, we come, Heavenly Father, acknowledging you that we honor you. We praise you, Father God. You are worthy of our praise, Heavenly Father. We come confessing our sins this morning, Lord, of omission and commission. We ask that you righten us, O oh, Heavenly Father, that you convict us where we're wrong, that you cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again, Lord God, that we might walk with you in sweet fellowship. We thank you for those who are under the sound of my voice this morning. Father God, you know who they are. We ask because you're God and God all by yourself that you do what a sovereign God would do. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you've already done for us. And if the psalmist said, if you don't do anything else, you've already done enough. We thank you, Father God, ask that you touch our hearts this morning, Lord God, that the word might fall upon fertile ground, Lord, that we might leave different than when we first came in. I ask, oh, Father God, for a blessing upon this country right now, Lord. You know what we're in need of, Heavenly Father, because you know all and you can do all. So, Father, we thank you for New Jerusalem. We ask this continued blessing upon our pastor that you continue to pour revelation knowledge into his spirit, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for those under the sound of my voice. Thank you, Father God, for this is yet the day that you made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We ask right now, Lord God, that all the doors that are open in the unadulterated word goes forward, that some poor soul may come and ask, what must I do to know your God? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for life, health, and strength. We ask your continued blessing, continue to cover us, continue to lead us. Fill us, O oh Heavenly Father, as an empty pitcher before a full fountain, that we might be a living epistle. I ask, Father God, that you continue to touch, you continue to move the ministries here, Heavenly Father, at this church. That it's all about you, that it's not about us, that we must decrease as you increase, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, right now, your will and not our will be done, O oh Lord that we continue to send prayers to a God who is able. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We ask as we commit it to you now, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, our Prince of Peace, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this another day. We love you, Father God. Teach us how to love you, how to love others as you have so loved us. Teach us, Lord God, how to forgive others as you have forgiven us, that we might walk in right fellowship, Lord. Thank you for the sacrifice of your darling son. Father, we commit it to you now, Lord. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this church, this day, in the mighty name of Jesus. And all in agreement said, amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Isn't he worthy? He woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. Said enter his course with thanksgiving. Let's enter his course with praise. Come on, let's worship him and give him an honor. Our great God deserves a great praise. If he's done anything for you, we should give him the praise that matches that. If he's done anything for you, our praise should match. Ready to worship him, ready to praise him, ready to say how he's great, how he is amazing, how we glorify him, how we praise him. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's get ready to worship God together. Amen. <laughs> Hey. I thank God for giving us the activity of our limbs yeah. to be
be able to give everything that is due unto him. Without him, we won't be here. Can I get a witness? Amen.
serve a big God that can handle any and all things that come in our way and in our lives. Any sickness, any, any heartache, he's able to heal it all. He's able to handle it. No matter what your situation is, God can handle it.
what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. He can handle anything. When I was lost out there in the world and I wanted to escape, he handled that. When the doctor said that I looked like I was dying, my organs were failing. Guess what? My God, he handled it. My sister here was diagnosed with cancer. But today she stands cancer free. Because God, he handled it. My sister over here, she had a child that was sick in the hospital. Couldn't figure out what was going on with the baby. But you know what? Our God, he handled it. My sister here has a child with autism. And you know what? Our God continues to handle it. My brother over here had a baby that was one pound and some ounces. And had some brain damage. But you know what? My God, he handled it. My sister here, I know that she deals with trials and tribulations. I know that the enemy looks to sift her as wheat. But you know what? My God, he continues to handle it. My sister here dealt with eye issues. Could have even been blind. But you know what my God did? He handled it. That's why I say, give him praise. Because he can handle it. Now yeah, my God can handle it. Every day he can handle it. Our Savior can handle it. Our God, he is awesome.
listen, listen. The reality is you sit next to someone, you have no idea what they have gone through in the last six months. You're sitting across from someone who thought about just throwing in the time. You have no idea how God has kept them. You have no idea how God has handled it. He can handle it. Come on, let's give God praise one more time. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here. I'll try it again. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else on a Sunday morning than in the presence of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, with the people of God. So if this is your first time here, we say good morning to you. If you're also here and you're celebrating a birthday this week, would you please stand? Amen. Both our nurses in the back. Miss Sterling, amen. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. May God bless you all with many more. It's y'all sweet 16, huh? Amen. God bless y'all. Amen. Happy birthday to you. If you're celebrating marriage this week, would you please stand? Marriage, there's a hand up. Is that a birthday or I don't know who's down there. I can't see. Happy birthday and, and happy anniversary. I, I don't know who it is. Hey, okay. Happy birthday. Is that a happy birthday? Happy birthday. God bless you. Any marriages this week? Any marriages this week? Amen. If you're online, there's oh, up there. All right. Happy anniversary. Oh. All right. Happy anniversary. Amen. God bless you. Amen. May God be. Come on, y'all. Clap it up. Happy anniversary. Amen. Listen, this Wednesday, we'll be having our recharge Bible study. Wednesday night Bible study, amen. We plug in every Wednesday in the EC or you can join us. This week we will not be on Zoom, so it's important for you to be in the building. This week, 6 o'clock, amen. If you even get here at 6.15, still come, amen. There's a word for you this Wednesday, so please make sure, amen, you are out today. I feel good today. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I feel real good today. Um, um, hell to the victors, amen. Let's keep it moving, all right. Remember, we're having our sock, hat, glove drive. Our nurses ministry is sponsoring our sock, hat, and glove drive. If you have socks, hats, or gloves, please, you can donate them in the vestibule now until November 30th. Also, we want to remind you that on October 31st, here at the church, we'll be having our Harvest Fest from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So please make sure you come out, bring the whole family out, bring your children, bring your great children. How many of you going to bring your great-grandchildren? Trying to pull it. There we go. All right. Bring your great grands out. Amen. We thank God for it. Come on out. Amen. We're excited about that. Also, we want to remind you, if you plan to participate in our Christian Counseling Certificate Program um, training, please make sure you register today. Please, y'all, don't, don't wait. Now, I asked y'all three weeks ago, and I counted 10 hands. Amen. But, but I need you to register if you plan to come. We want to equip our people here at New J. Amen. This is going out all over the region. We, we, we've advertised this all the way to Flint, to Lansing, and even to Toledo. Um, we're advertising it, trying to get churches to um, bring out a team of people who can serve as a counseling ministry. Would you be, will you be a certified therapist? No, you know that. This is not that. This is giving you some surface techniques and skills, things deeper than you can get on Google. And you will be trained by a licensed therapist and pastor, Dr. Lance Flood. So he's going to be giving us all things Christian-based. So if you are interested, and you don't have to, but if you are interested, some of you have already registered, and I thank God for you, but there are a few of you who said you're going to do it. I need you to do that as soon as you can so that we can be best prepared um, for November 11th. Amen. Come on, clap your hands. Amen for that. We're also still in our capital campaign. All right, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase our space. What we want to do at the end of the day is we want to connect both these buildings. And so what we're going to need is we're going to need an extended atrium, vestibule, whatever you want to call it, that stretches across the parking lot here. 
All right? And so what we need to do is we need to make sure, we, I believe that we can do this, but I don't want to be by myself. I believe that we can do this, so what that means is it's going to take sacrifice from us all. All right? We want to be able to raise enough money to be able to do this um, so that we don't have to go begging the bank for anything. Now, I know that's a strong statement, but I believe that we can do this. I saw us pay off a mortgage, burn a mortgage during the pandemic. I believe we can do this. I believe we can do this. So I'm asking you to please share with us in that, amen, as we get closer to our goal, the more things we can do with showing you 3D illustrations of how we want it to be set up. Um, I know some people are like, uh uh-uh, because I don't know what we're doing. I'm not giving nothing until I see what we're doing. So I'm telling you, amen. Thank God for faith, right? Thank God for faith. Amen. Certainly faith means that you have to move in seasons where you don't specifically see it. Amen. But we have casted the vision so many times. Amen. So that's what we want to do. And I wanted to make sure I spent a moment explaining what our purpose was. Amen. We have a wonderful children's church group that does children's church every single week. Amen. And those of you that are parents who are coming in, um, it would be nice to come in and be under one roof. Listen, y'all, if you don't care about it, if you're not excited about it, then it's going to take us longer to reach our goal. Um, but for those of you who just come into this side, it may not mean much to you, but empathy and compassion teaches us that while it's not your problem, you can still identify when it's challenging for other people. So there are a group of people who come in every week who's back and forth between two buildings. And when inclement weather comes or when some of y'all drive, y'all need to retake driver's training because some of y'all pull in here doing 60 miles an hour. Amen. I'm just joking. Um, but it's safe. We want people to be safe. Amen. Walking across the parking lot. Children run around all the time. Amen. And so that's what we want to do. That's our goal. And I'm believing God for clarity and I'm believing God that he is going to give provision for the vision. Amen. Are you in agreement with that? Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. There's a chili cook-off coming up in November. I believe you can still register. I'm looking for... Who said yes? I, I, I can't see you. Oh, there we go. Charmise. All right. You can still register today in the vestibule after service. Register for the chili cook-off. Amen. We want to see um, how good you can cook chili. Amen. Just be fair and don't put no hidden ingredients in there. Amen. Send nobody to the hospital. Amen. All right. Um, listen, if this is your first time here, would you please stand? Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to New Jerusalem. Amen. In just a few minutes, everybody's going to come say hello to you and love on you. Amen. If you don't want to, just say back up off me. Just say back up off me. Amen. Listen, go and greet somebody. Spread the peace. Show some love. Amen. We'll be back with our offering. God bless you today. Sanctuary. Amen. 
and the first time you say, why are they screaming for offering? Well, we believe that God loves a cheerful giver. That's what the word tells us, that he loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So we give because we are excited to give. And we know that whatever we give, God's going to give it back to us in some kind of way. Amen. It may not be a financial return, but it will be a blessing. Amen. It be, and it may be a blessing that you didn't even know that you needed. Let me tell you something. I've been in the season, myself and my wife, we've been in the season where um, things have just been catching us off guard. I don't want to be transparent about this um, as much as I can. Um, things have been catching us off guard. Um, but in that, we've never stopped giving. We've been faithful to the tithe. And let me tell you, some of those unexpected um, challenges that have come up, let me tell you that God has been blessing in ways that we could not even predict. That I just believe that God has like a reservoir of blessings, and when you need them the most, he just releases them from heaven. I just believe that, and I believe it starts with commitment to the tithe. I'm telling you, family, I've been tithing since I was a child. Since I was a child, I would get 50 cents. My mom taught me, my dad taught me the purpose of tithing from a young age. And as I got older, um, things were challenging. You know, bills stack up. And you got to make a commitment. You got to choose. You got to make a sacrifice. And I've always put God first. And let me tell you, while I'm not a rich person, I'm rich in favor, y'all. And I believe that it starts because of my commitment to the tithe. It's only 10%. Think of it like this. If you had 10 rolls of paper towel, would you give God one? Certainly, you would give God one roll of paper towel if you had 10. That's all he asks for is 10% of everything that you have financially. Not your net, your gross. 10% of whatever you have financially. He just asks that you bring it back to him by way through the church. I have done that my entire life, family, and I believe it's in because of that that I've been rich in the Lord's favor. Do things go wrong in my life? Oh, my God, all the time. I don't have time to tell you about it. But every time I look around, God is keeping me. And he's coming through for me. And I'm grateful to him for that. And I believe it's not only because of prayer and faithfulness, but also financially speaking, it's the commitment to the tithe. So if you're one of those people who have not had the faith to tithe, I'm telling you to just try it. And I believe that God is going to show you how faithful. The Bible says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. That's what the Bible says. He says, try me in this. If you don't believe it, try it. That's what he says. That's what he says. So I, I challenge you to try that today. Listen, I want to remind you, as you give, our building fund is so important. Um, because, you know, we got to keep moving. we got to keep going. we got things that always happen. But our capital campaign is separate from our building fund. So when you are giving, please make sure you make that distinction on your envelopes. All right? If you're trying to give toward our building fund, Amen. We need that, certainly. Amen. But also, if you want to give sowing seed going toward our capital campaign to increase our space, then please make sure you make that distinction. All right? At this time, if you need an envelope, would you please lift your hand? I'm sorry. I should have said that while I was talking. If you need an envelope, please lift your hand. All right? If you wish to give on Giblify today, you can. The instructions are on the screens today. Amen. Envelope here on this side. God bless you. Amen. Envelope here. Oh, I thought you were. All right. Amen. Everyone ready to give? All right. Our ushers will be, be beginning from the back. Amen. They'll make their way to the front. Please pass your envelope. Amen. To the aisle. Amen. Where the usher is walking up. Amen. Deacons and trustees, you may come up. Amen. You may come up. can't be God's given no matter how hard you try. I ask you to continue to keep our sick and shut in in your prayers. Amen. We're sending our love and our prayers to those 
amen, who are recovering, amen, from certain illnesses who may find themselves in the hospital. Listen, I want to say this, um, in case you're one of those people who are wondering, or in case some people bring it to you, um, you know, because when people don't understand things, um, sometimes they go and talk to the person um, next to them instead of coming to a source um, that can give, a, give an answer. Um, but I don't always share with the church um, people's medical business because of HIPAA. Um, this, is not, this is not 1999 or 2009 where we're just in the church. We stream to the world every Sunday. All right, and unless you've given me permission, I don't share who's in the hospital and what's wrong with them across the uh, internet um, unless I've had permission to do that. All right, so please don't think because pastor hasn't said anything um, that I'm not praying and I don't know what's going on. Now, if, I, if you ain't told me, I probably don't know. If you haven't told the deacons, I probably don't know. Um, but please, please be mindful. If I have not said it across the pulpit during Sunday service, it's because I am being mindful. It's my, it's my secular responsibility because of what I do in my profession. That I got to know how to keep secrets. So I've been trained in HIPAA not to share people's personal business unless that person gives me permission and they want the church to know. Amen. So if I don't say, please don't think that I'm not praying or I'm not sharing what's going on with other people. Trust me and believe that I am praying. The Bible tells us if there's any sick among you, let them call upon the elders of the church. That's James 5, 13 and 14. Amen. So we are praying for you. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this offering today. Father, we pray that you will receive it now. Lord God, as it leaves our hands, as it leaves our households, as it leaves our spreadsheets and budget forms, and Lord God, now we put it into your hands. Father God, we pray that you would use it for the edification of the body and the furtherance of the gospel. God, bless those who wanted to give but didn't have anything today. Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our worship team is coming back. Amen. And we'll be back with the word for the day. Does the Lions play today? Y'all know I know the Lions play today. <laughs> Am I going to preach any sooner today? No, because the Lions so dope, they're going to win anyway. <laughs>
of my heart will be acceptable in your sight father you are my strength and my redeemer and all of God's people said amen Numbers chapter 13 Numbers chapter 13 we've been in our series entitled the playbook and this is uh, the part whatever I don't it's part six it's, we've been here for a minute it is my goal to have us finish up next week. Amen. Today we'll be focused on concluding this series. Number chapter 13. I'm going to start reading at verse 17. It says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go into the mountains and see what the land is like where the people who dwell in it are strong and weak, few or many. Whether the land that dwell there is in good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether the forest are there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. They went up through the south and came to Hebron. Ahamai, Shishai, and Telamai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebrew was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. Now, you've had grapes before. And you know it don't take two people to carry grapes. That's how big those clusters were. They also bought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eskal or the Valley of the Cluster because of what the men of Israel had cut down there. They returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation and the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it, it flows with milk and honey. And look, this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, 
we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Melekites, and the, they dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and, and the Amorites, they dwell in, in the mountains. And the Canaanites, God, they dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb. Let the church say, then Caleb. Quieted the people before Moses said, let us go up at once and take possession. For we are well able, let's try to say well able, to overcome it. But the men who had gone with them said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who saw it, men of great stature, there we saw the giants and the descendants of Anak come from, which came from the giants, and, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You may be seated. We talk today, part six of the playbook. I want to talk about the scouting report. One of the fascinating things about the game of American football are the expectations built within the framework of competition. Each team, each coach, each players have expectations which may very well be based upon one key report called the scouting report. But so on that scouting report provides a player, a coach, a team with expectations. Expectations to win or expectations to lose. That's what's on the scouting report. A team that goes into a game with a losing mentality can go into an, with, with a losing mentality, not expecting to win, will more than likely lose. But a team that has a winning mentality can go into an opponent's stadium or arena with winning expectations. And these expectations are built from execution and experience. Executing what has been in the playbook and the experience that has come with that executing. And as it relates, family, to our purpose and our spiritual growth, we have been studying key points and plays to a winning mentality. That is, if we run the route, if we catch the ball, we'll move the chain. What's the chain? That means we'll get first downs. And if you get enough first downs, you'll eventually score a touchdown or you'll be in the best position to. So when we run the route and we study the playbook, we got to understand that we must continue to seek God, obey God, believe God, serve God, worship God, and now fear no man but God. Family, I want to suggest this to you that fear is a feeling. Fear is a spirit. It's a condition that paralyzes growth. Fear is a hindrance. And some of us will remain unaware of how well we can do a thing because of fear. So, some of us will, will remain ignorant of our potential because of fear. You, you might be one of the greatest swimmers ever, but fear keeps you out the water. You might be one of the greatest fashion designers ever, Yet fear keeps you from buying the sewing machine. Fear stalls us out. Fear will cause us to miss blocks. Football speaking, fear will cause us to drop the ball. Fear will cause us to miss the play. Fear will cause us to run the wrong way. I'll never forget in Little League, I didn't play football, I played basketball. And one of my teammates, he was so scared. He was so nervous to be out there playing. And he wound up catching the ball, Minister McGill, and when you know, the whole game, we've been going one direction, the same direction. We've been going the whole same way. And when he got the ball, guess which way he went? Fear will cause us to run the wrong way. Fear will cause us to fumble our future. Some can't relate because the thing about a fumble is sometimes you lose the fumble and sometimes you get it back. 
But in this process, it creates havoc and chaos. And suddenly, your anxiety hits the limit. And it's all because of fear. You ever wonder how it's this, all these things come crashing down in your life? Perhaps you've fumbled your faith, and now you're scrambling trying to get back on track. And I got to say this, one of the ways to help alleviate fear is research. It's the research of a given reality. My wife would tell you, I research everything. I, I research everything. When I'm flying into a city, I research everything from the aircraft to the seating arrangements. I want to know why the wings get back into its regular position when it goes through turbulence. I want to know. Because what I feel through turbulence, I need to know that the aircraft don't feel what I feel. I need to know that the pilots don't feel what, what I feel and experience. And so I research in order to alleviate some of my anxiety. When I'm flying to a city, I research the aircraft. I research the airport. I research the route from the hotel to the airport. I research the hotel. I research how big the lobby is. I research what the amenities are like because I'm seeing myself there before I get there. I'm seeing myself there before I get there because it helps alleviate my anxiety. I'll never forget, we went to Miami a few years ago and we wanted to go to the Sea Aquarium. I went and Google Earth, listen, Google Earth is like my social media. Like how some of y'all are always on Facebook, I'm always on Google Earth. Because on Google Earth, so cool, you can click on that little blue circle and it'll put you right in the establishment. So we were going and I was already up in the aquarium before we even left Detroit. When we got there, I'm telling Lady Kim, where are we going? I said, look, if you go on this side, that's where the sharks are. Then how you know I saw it on Google Earth? I'm seeing myself. I'm researching where I'm going. Because by doing that, I'm helping to alleviate my anxiety. We, went to, we go, always go to Miami. That's our favorite place to go. And in case you want to bless your pastor for Pastor Appreciation Month, amen. Flights are up. Hey, man, but if all y'all put all y'all funds together, you can get me and my wife and my kids there. But anyway, she said last time we went to Miami, she said, she said let's go to, um, what is it called, Little, Little Havana. I said, ooh, Little Havana. And that don't sound, okay, well, let me go see what that look like. I got to go see. It sounds like a place that has a lot of culture, um, but, you know, I ain't got to say it. Okay. So I said, let me go and research the place. And what I researched, right, it helped me ease my anxiety, but I didn't share the research with her. So when we got there, there were murals all over Little Havana. Um, and somebody said it is. Y'all been there before? It, all over Little Havana. Um, and and, and there, there are a few people walking around. Um, and my wife was a little apprehensive. Um, she wanted to go to Little Havana. Um, but when we got out the car... <laughs> She's going to kill me. This is two weeks in a row. Lord, she goes, y'all pray for it. We're going to need marriage counseling. <laughs> when, when she got out of the car, she said, baby, let's, let's, let's go. Let's, let's get back in the car. <laughs> I said, I thought she wanted to go to Little Havana. This is where we are. But see, I wasn't, I had no apprehension because I've already saw myself there. I already saw myself walking in a little coffee shop. All my, I already saw myself there. Point I'm trying to make is, family, you got to see yourself where you are before you get there if you hope to alleviate some anxiety. Well, I want to suggest this to you. What I'm doing is I'm researching my reality in sports, in business. This is called a scouting report. In competitive business, in competitive dance, in competitive sports, the opposite team will go and scout their opponents. Is this not what Moses is telling the children of Israel? We're going to send spies, and I want to know what the people look like. I want to know what the, in fact, I want to know how big the fruit is there. Go and get the harvest and bring it back. I want to know about the people. I want to know about the place, and I want to know about the land. Because that is going to tell us what we need to do and how we need to go and conquer the land. However, the scouting report in itself won't be enough to establish a winning mentality. Because watch this. Belief must always suffocate fear. Because depending on what's in the report could cause doubt and fear. Oh, they're bigger than us. We're not going to beat them. Right? So there must always be a response to the report. And this is what brings us to our text today. The question of the day is, are you going to trust your playbook? in spite of what the scouting report says. When we look at the text today, I'm almost finished. Having escaped Egypt, 
This portion of the book of Numbers has somewhat of a theme of people complaining about God's process. Can we keep it real this morning? How many of you found yourself complaining about God's process? God bless all you super spiritual people. Um, but for me, sometimes you find yourself complaining about God's process. Now, here, let me give you the backdrop. Here's the backdrop. Hey, God, we were in Egypt. We were in bondage. But while we were in bondage, at least they fed us three times a day. While we're in bondage, at least we know where our dwelling place will be. At least we knew the land. At least we knew the expectations of the Egyptian culture. Man, you took us across the Red Sea, God. That's great. That's super. That's cool. Now we've been in this wilderness, and we've been eating manna, but what the Egyptians offered us is better than, tastes better than the, we get tired of this, this, this manna. We want something else. So, God, did you bring us all the way out here to kill us? Because, God, you could have killed me back there. But now I'm here. And you said we were going to go into a land flowing with milk and honey, but when I look around, there's no milk, there's no honey. We're in the wilderness. God, I'm, I'm, I'm a little frustrated with your process. This is the background of what's going on. So Moses steps up, and he says, okay, let me get 12 spies. 12 spies, one from each tribe, they are sent to report the land. Watch this. They are to give a report, not their recommendation. You got to watch people that like to remix the report with their recommendation. Nobody asks you your opinion. We ask you for the facts. We, we show me the hard facts. We ask you for the facts. We didn't ask you your recommendation. Well, 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 they came back with a recommendation when they're supposed to give the report of what God will do, right? This land was indeed flourishing with produce and promise and clusters of grapes. The land is flowing with opportunity. But oftentimes with opportunity, we miss our window because of fear. This is a good, th th there is no good reason for us to make our no bigger than God's go. No good reason, right? So the scholar report, as I hurry along, reveals the truth of the land, truly being that, yes, it was one with produce, it was one with promise, yet the occupants of the land seem to be troubling ten of the spies. But there are two who see things just a little bit different. Same conditions, two different perspectives. And this winning perspective is just 16% favorability. That's two out of 12. That means one out of six. 16% chance of taking the land. The odds seem stacked against one by the name of Joshua, the other by the name of Caleb. But up against the challenge, what I love about the Bible is there is an important stress on names in the Bible. See, see I, I love our names that, that we got today. Um, we name our, our people just, okay. But in the Bible, there was great significance on the whole nature and future of an individual. So here's Joshua and Caleb. And up against the challenge, these are the two in the 16% favorability um, 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 count column that they don't forget who they are. Might I suggest that they are the two prominent tribes of Israel. Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim which will later become the dominant tribe in the northern kingdom. Caleb is from the tribe of Judah, which will become the dominant tribe in the southern kingdom. And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but when you have discovered who you are, family, don't lose yourself in the face of a challenge. You cannot lose yourself in the face of a challenge. Don't forget who you are, and don't forget uh, whose you are. You cannot forget whose you are. When you read the Bible, you understand that the Word tells us that my God shall supply all of my needs. Can we deal with the my God for a second here? My God is the one who spoke reality into irrelevance when he made the heavens and the earth. My God is the one who whispered a word to Noah that it was going to rain, told him to build an ark. 
my God told Moses, um, protected Moses in the basket going down a river. My God took Moses and the children of Israel across the Red Sea. All right, you ain't read your Bible in a while. Let me make it more adjacent. My God woke me up this morning. Is there anybody in this room today? My God gave me the activity of my limbs. My God put clapping in my hands, put something in my feet, put words in my mouth. My God. So when you're up against a challenge, you cannot forget who you are and who you are. I don't care how big they are in the land. I don't care how big the challenge is, baby. I'm about to tell my challenge how big my God is. Do I got anybody in this room today that got enough faith to stand in the face of your challenge and say, you know what? I ain't going to let you worry me, but you're going to worry about the God in me. Let me, let, me, let, let, me, let me move, let me move, let me move, let me move. I don't want to get too happy here. I'm going to lose my voice. Here it is. You can't lose yourself because the battle looks too big. Uh, you got to tell your battle how big God is. Uh, so, so we have in this scouting report, um, watch this. Um, God does not expect the spies to ignore the report. Remember, he says, give the report of the land. That's the report. Yes, the land flourishes with milk and honey. Yes, yeah, there are some inhabitants there. Uh, yes, there are some giants there. That's the report. They added in their recommendation, right? They were not supposed to do that. So God does not desire us to ignore the facts of the report, but he does desire us to ignite our faith. Don't ignore the facts. But ignite your faith. Would you tell your neighbor, ignite your faith? I wouldn't suggest for us to ignore the battle um, because the reality is depression is real. C cancer is real. Heartache is real. But my God is real. You, you got to ignite your faith in the face of a challenge. Verse 32, let me move. Here it is says, well, um, you know what? These, 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 these people here, they, um, they, 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 they devour its inhabitants. They are men of great stature. This is a report of the, of the land. Um, and one would think that the report of the spies is the report of the land, but really we have two different dialogues going on here. One report is about the land. The other report is about the spies. Cities are large, they're fortified, the people are giants, despite the land, there are no vacancies, there are occupants everywhere. Testimony of all the spies agrees that the land was rich. It's so rich that it creates conflict. Can, can, I, can I say, I, I got to preach to five people just a little bit. I, I, got my, I got my hand held over there just in case I lose my mind. Um, there are occupants everywhere. They say the land... Um, through which we have gone as spies as a land that devours its inhabitants. That's not a lie. Yeah. That's very true. Can I tell us why? Here it is. The land is so rich that it creates conflict. The fertility of the land, Mary, calls everyone in the region to want to live there. Which meant there was a lot of blood shed between inhabitants and invaders. C can I preach it just five of y'all real quick? The, the favor that's coming uh, to you, people are already fighting over it. I don't know who needs to hear this today. But if I can be just prophetic for a little bit, they are fighting for what's about to be yours. Here's the children of Israel have not walked into the land yet, but there are people already fighting over how fruitful the land is. There will be some people that has some conflict with the kind of favor that you're getting ready to walk into, but you cannot misdiagnose your favor and make it be fear. God has already given them the land and when God has given you favor, you've got to trust the process when you cannot trace the promise. Amen. Amen. So what happens is they see, they see giants. They see giants 
but they see themselves as grasshoppers. And they make the crucial mistake that fear would influence us to make. They leave God out. Family, don't leave God out. Why would you do that? No, like, why would you ever do that? Why would you leave God out? Well, fear and distraction will cause you to leave him out. It will cause you to leave him out. I got to say this. Uh, uh, you can't conquer giants until you conquer fear. Uh, all right, let me move on. Here it is. You, you. David, family, didn't fear his way into the valley to face that uncircumcised Philistine. By the time he got to the battleground, he already had in his mind that he was going to win. He, he, he didn't have fear to not get him there. They see themselves as grasshoppers, which means it's possible at times that we see ourselves through our own insecurities. Is that, uh, is that too deep? Because, just because you see yourself one way <laughs> does not mean that's how your enemy see you. Oh, oh man, hold on. I got to borrow a few minutes because a lot of us have been moving through life seeing ourselves through the lenses of our own insecurities. We don't understand how great we are. We don't understand how gifted we are because we've been seeing ourselves through our own doubts and insecurities. And the reason why the attack from the enemy is so intense, the pressure is so real in your life because even demons have discernment. They can see how gifted you are when you can't see how gifted you are. That's why the intensity is so hot because if you ever figure out how anointed you are, if you ever figure out how gifted you are, if you ever figure out how brilliant you are, Oh, my God, the world ain't going to be ready for you. But as long as the devil can keep you trapped in fear and see yourself through your own insecurities, he's winning. Yeah. Yes, he is. So they see themselves as grasshoppers. Do you know how small a grasshopper is compared to a typical human being? It doesn't compare. But this is how small they see themselves. Truth is, can I tell you this? Your enemies may be more afraid of how anointed you are than you are afraid of them. Let me go. All, all 12 spies were from a generation that saw God and what he already done. They saw him send the plagues to pass over the parts of the Red Sea, pour down manna from heaven, and provide in the wilderness. Why would this be any different? But watch this. When we begin to doubt what God has promised us, it helps to do a total recall. Let's just say total recall over everything that he has done in your life up to this point. Uh, oh, my God. In other words, don't minimize even the smallest victory because small victories can have major impacts. So what happens here, they forgot the Abrahamic covenant, which was unconditional promise. All they had to do was live through it. Would you help me preach to your neighbor and say, just live through it? That's all you have to do is live through it. You cannot forget. I mean, watch this. How is it that Joshua and Caleb saw that they could be victorious in the land because they had unfailing faith and an unconditional promise from an unmatched God. But now here's a shift in the text. I found my exit. Here it is. They were to report on the produce, the people in the place, as they were going to conquer Canaan. But each of these spies left one way. Ten came back another way overtaken by fear and unbelief. What's of note here is that the children of Israel are on a God-ordained mission. They are headed to Canaan, but everybody can't go to Canaan. Can I deal with it for just a small second? Can you give me a 30-second ad real quick to deal with this? We've got to stop complaining to God who decides to walk out of our lives. <laughs> we've got to stop complaining to God over who decides to walk out of our lives. Yes, yes. I'm going to try it one more time. Yes. 
Because you know you didn't pray, you didn't cry, you didn't cry, you didn't pray, you didn't pray, you didn't cry because they ain't calling no more, they ain't coming over no more, they ain't liking your stuff on social media no more, they ain't DMing you no more, and you boohooing about it. Listen to me, please. Stop complaining to God about people who have walked out of your life. Because what if God was saving you from destruction? Oh, my God. What if God was saving you from depression? What if God was saving you from detainment? What if God moving them was God saving you from them? I'm just trying to, I'm just, I'm just, let me testify. Here it is. They going to Canaan, and guess what? Everybody not going to Canaan. You keep on complaining if you want to. Your complaining going to get you canceled. Okay, let me move. That was my ad is over. Back to the back to the, the observations are the same, but the interpretations are incredibly different. They discovered grapes of an unusual size. Can you imagine grapes so big that it takes two people to carry a cluster? If the grape, if the seed is that big. Can you imagine what the land is like? Okay, y'all thought grapes just fall out the sky? Something about the land had to be good. Said it's flowing with milk and honey, which means it is incredibly fruitful. Watch this. They carried the cluster back to the camp, and it was supposed to be a mark of favor, but it became a monument of fear. Because what did they do, Jared? They saw God's favor the wrong way. Family, fear will have you seeing things the wrong way. Oh, my God. Instead of them focusing on the size of the grapes being the evidence of how rich the land was that was about to be theirs, they allowed the size of the grapes to intimidate them and provoke fear. One writer said, Instead of them being intoxicated with joy, you do no great, never mind. Instead of them being intoxicated with joy, they became intimidated by fear. Can I say this? Stop misdiagnosing the favor that's on your life. Perhaps your big problems uh, uh, are, are a result of having big promise, which involves a big process. Here's my conclusion. I'm done. We got two groups of people. The majority says we can't. The minority says we can't. Sometimes you will find yourself being in the minority. But here's what I discovered. I'd rather be in the minority with major faith than in the majority with zero faith. It's all the same land, same people. One walks away with faith, the other walks away with fear. So that means faith doesn't result in what's in our environment, but merely from a trust in God, which begins in our hearts. So Caleb truly remembered God's promise to Abraham of the land and the subsequent blessings. In Genesis, God told Abraham, to your offspring, I will give this land. So if God said this all the way back to Abraham, God is a man. He cannot lie. There, 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 there's two things God can't do, and I know he can do everything. Two things he can't do. He can't lie and he can't fail. Amen. So Caleb understood. Oh, Jesus, this has blessed me. Caleb understood. Okay, I don't care how big the giants are. If God said it, I believe it. Because that's the kind of God that I'm hooked up with. That's the kind of God that I serve. So whoever stands in my way, listen, I'm going to always believe the report of the Lord. That's my question for you today. Whose report will you believe? Because at the end of the day, this isn't the report of Joshua and Caleb. It's the response of Joshua and Caleb to what the Lord has already spoken on. Therefore, to not believe that the land will be theirs, that the giants will fall, 
is doubting the power and the presence and the assurance of God. And as a result, watch this, the people who have spread the negative report, when you turn the page into Numbers 14, they receive the death sentence in the wilderness. Some people you connected to right now, I'm speaking this of your life. Some people need to die in the wilderness. Now, now I'm not, I'm not talking about. I'm not. I mean the relationship needs to die. I'm not. Listen, I done, I done had too many deaths in my family the last 40 days. I ain't, mm-mm. The relationship needs to die in the wilderness. Think about it. If you stay connected to the negative report, people doubting the favor that's in your life, what God has said concerning your life, you will never walk into that land that's abundance and soil. Think about how big those grapes are. Family, in the wilderness, Relationships got to die if they're not going to help you walk into your land. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute before you start clapping. Because sometimes those relationships ain't always friendships. Sometimes it's kin. Uh, Oh, my God, you just missed it. It was the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob, kids. They were related. And you got family split on what God said and what we feel. Can't nobody build faith on feelings. Man, I got to go. No, I got to go. I got to go. There it is. Don't allow your fear to forfeit your future. Is there anybody here who doesn't have Jesus in their hearts, in their lives? and you want to receive him I'm going to send an invitation you know the Bible says we just talked about it that the blood that was being shed there in in the land is because the inhabitants were battling the invaders because they wanted to live there and the heavens like no this is our land so we're going to strike you down you can't have our land blood was shed as a result of the invaders trying to take that away I got to tell you that there was more bloodshed 2,000 years later, 2,023 years ago at Calvary. The enemy wanted to snatch what was about to be ours in the salvation of the Lord. But the blood was shed at Calvary so that we might receive what was about to be ours. Thank God for the blood that was shed at Calvary. I got one person that believes that. Thank God for the blood that was shed at Calvary. Because where there is no blood, there is no blessing. We thank God today. If you're here and you want to give your hearts to Christ, give your life to Christ, rededicate your life to Christ, you may do so at this time. You may come forth. You may stand where you are. You're here and you have the love of Christ, the blood of Jesus on your life, but you don't have a church home. You want to join our church today. You may stand where you are. You may come forth. Our deacons are here. They'll hold your hand and walk you through the process of becoming a member here and receiving Christ to your hearts. God's plan of salvation is that he loves you, but he cannot be connected to your sin. So he sent his son in his place, in our place, will take our place so that we might be declared righteous. So when God sees our sin, he sees the blood of Jesus. What could wash away my sins? Your sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's you today. Would you please stand? Amen. Seeing none has come yet, there is still room. Clap your hands. We were blessed by the word today. So I will walk in your peace. Let us all stand. Your spirit is within me. My victory. Say hallelujah.
God, we're going to believe your report. We know that challenges will come in our lives, interpersonal challenges, internal, external challenges, circumstances that we might not be able to change. But Lord God, we believe that you can change it. And we fight because of your word that's in us. We believe because of your word that's in us. We are motivated to take what's ours as it relates to your promises because of your word that's in us. So God, we're going to counter fear with faith. That we're going to choose faith over fear no matter what the circumstances might be. Because God, we believe that you're much bigger than our battles. So I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray for faith for everyone under the sound of my voice. Now God, as we leave this place, we won't leave your presence. Be with us and guide us in the path that you will have us to go. We will give you praise, honor, and glory.